In this section, we're going to prepare to set up our computer with the Solaris software. Now that we've launched the system, we're going to enter into the BIOS just to confirm that it'll boot from CD-ROM or any supported media. Solaris is available on CD-ROM as well as DVD, and you may optionally install it across the network. We'll just wait for the initialization of the processors and the disk subsystem before we explore the BIOS. Now the reason why we're exploring the BIOS is to ensure that the CD-ROM is the first boot device and to ensure that PXC or any other boot devices will not prevent us from booting from the CD-ROM. So in this installation we're going to focus on the four CDs that are required to install Solaris 10. Working with Solaris 10 version 106 and it is considered to be the latest. This is the x86 version as you can see our BIOS has a password we'll just specify that and now we're in the BIOS we can navigate freely so once within the BIOS let's take a look at what some of the options that you'll find in your environment are on our system as you can see it's a Dell PowerEdge 2600 in the upper right hand corner it's got two Xeon processors 2400 megahertz and it's running a 12 version of the BIOS in the event you're running a Dell or an HP or IBM certainly consider upgrading the BIOS if one's available from the provider of your system. Usually an updated BIOS will help in rectifying any install time problems that you're likely to encounter so just keep that in mind. There's a special OS install mode which isn't applicable in our scenario. This is usually for the Windows operating system for forcing a low amount of memory such as 256 to prevent crashes especially with the older Windows operating system so this we can ignore for installing Solaris 10 CPU information the boot sequence which is really why we're here as you can see it's set to boot first from the gigabit slot that you see followed by any diskettes then CD-ROM as well as the hard drive. We can alter or move these items up and down using plus or minus. For example, to send a CD-ROM up, we'll use minus, down, plus, and CD-ROM will become the first device, followed by the PXE. This GE slot that you see here is really for the PIXE or PXE-based booting, which is really a way of booting your system across the network using parameters provided by a DHCP server including a boot image which Solaris provides and we'll look at later on when we install Solaris 10 across the wire but since we're doing a local media install a local CD-ROM is all that's necessary so having said that we've moved CD-ROM to the top and we can check out other specifications of our system including the hard drive sequence it starts with the system BIOS booted devices first then the embedded Fujitsu's which means if you plug in a SATA or ATA drive whatever is supported other than the SCSI subsystem it'll cause this particular Dell box to boot those devices prior to the Fujitsu hard drives that are configured here are integrated devices including the primary SCSI controller CD-ROM controller, USB, and other common controllers including serial ports, whether or not they're enabled, and the embedded gigabit NIC, which is enabled with Pixie support, which isn't important right now, so if you wanted, you can make a change to the option using plus or minus. You can enable it without Pixie support, which will increase or increase the speed in which your system boots or reduce the amount of time that your system takes to boot. So let's enable it without Pixie support or PXE support. IRQs are a thing of the past to play with on most modern systems. IRQ management happens automatically. And the slot information pertains to the PCI Express slots that are available on our bus and whether or not we'd like to enable console redirection, which is a feature supported by many server class systems such as this Dell PowerEdge, which basically means that the typical output that you see on the VGA will be redirected to the first COM port, serial port 1. And in the case of an operating system such as Solaris, you can take advantage of being able to manipulate the system via the console, via console redirection. But there are other means of sending the output of the operating system to the console, including the GRUB or Grand Unified Bootloader, as well as when the operating system's up and running via TTY monitors or other third-party software. So you can do it directly through the BIOS in the Dell box and in other server class systems from other manufacturers as well as with software provided with the Solaris operating system including the bootloader itself. 
There's security, such as what password is tied to the system. It's always a good idea to have your BIOS locked or configured securely, especially on server class systems. From a security perspective, it's ideal that you lock it up to discourage or to at least stall the amount of changes or the time necessary to make changes to your system. And of course, these are unauthorized changes to the system. Whether or not the keyboard num lock is on is unimportant to us and the asset tag associated with the system. So there aren't too many options that we can modify here. What's important is as follows. The processor, which is in the upper left, the processor information, the version of the BIOS in the event that we do have install time problems, including the service tag in the event that we need support from the manufacturer, in this case, Dell. The fact that the date and time are set correctly. The fact that our CD-ROM will be booting by default and that we've disabled Pixie booting to reduce the amount of time necessary to boot the system. These are the important settings and once we've committed them we'll press escape and we'll save the changes and exit the BIOS system. Now this causes a reboot of course once we've exited the BIOS and after we've rebooted you'll see the entire system initialize once again and immediately following we'll see the CD-ROM device boot to the grub menu which allows us to set up the Solaris 10 x86 software. So by default server class systems such as this PowerEdge server tend to have embedded firmware as you see above and like with any x86 system provides you the ability to connect or to enter the BIOS via keystroke such as F2 or if you have the utility partition configured on the disk drives to use that partition. As you can see here we have three hard disks and two controllers, two LSI logic controllers and three Fujitsu hard drives. They are 36 gig hard drives that we'll be using. What you see here now is the default menu. It's advised that you move the arrow key up or down to prevent Solaris installer from booting. So we can discuss the settings or the options that you see here. If we simply press enter on the default option that you see here, Solaris, this will start the installer without starting a listener or redirecting the information that's typically sent to the screen to the console. So the default option or the first option which is highlighted will install Solaris or take us to the menus where we can install Solaris either in graphical mode or in text mode. However, Options 2 and 3, Solaris Serial Console TTYA corresponds to the first serial port, which is also known as COM1, and Solaris Serial Console TTYB corresponds to COM port 2 if your system has a COM port. Basically, options 2 and 3 that I'm hovering and alternating and toggling between allow you to redirect, as we saw with the Dell BIOS, to the console and it will redirect input and output to the console so that one could configure or run the installation process and configure the setup parameters via the serial console. You may be wondering what situation may cause you to want to configure the system via a COM based port and there are many situations. Take for example this particular server being located in a data center type scenario where you have limited space and you may actually have COM or console based systems with serial ports and serial connectivity. You simply connect a null cable between the central terminal server or console server or your laptop if that's how you're installing the system to the x86 box and once you have it connected and have selected from the VGA output serial console TTAY or TTYB then shortly thereafter if providing you have a terminal program such as Kermit running on your laptop or on the terminal server you will see the output redirected and will be able to interact with the text based installer and subsequently set up your Solaris system all without using any mouse keyboard or any other input device attached or even output device attached to the x86 box. So there are three default options. The installer uses Grub or the Grand Unified Bootloader to, pr to present us with these three options. Now by no means is this a comprehensive view of the Grand Unified Bootloader. There's much more it can do. By the way, this Grand Unified Bootloader is taken directly from the open source community. It is the default bootloader that you'll find within Linux-based environments 
which includes all of the Linux distros on the market today. This is the de facto bootloader that's in use, and the folks at, at Sun decided to bundle it with the x86 edition of Solaris. So that should communicate that the Grub or Grand Unified Bootloader is not a part of the Spark Solaris 10 version, but only a part of the x86 version, which makes perfect sense since Spark based boxes come with their own bootloader, the Open Boot program, which bootstraps the system and gets it up and running for you. So, on an x86 based system, we're using Grub as the initial menu for installation as well as the initial menu for selecting the kernel that you'd like to have loaded. We're going to go ahead and select simply Solaris. Later on when we install via the console, we'll select option 2 to install via COM1. But for now, let's just proceed with Solaris as our option. And what you'll see here is that the kernel is actually loading, performing some device configuration and initiation and detection to see what's installed on the system, the processors, the memory video cards and other applicable information, other useful and applicable information. Great. Now this multi-boot that you see loading, well, that you just saw loading, is fully compliant with the multi-boot specification. Grub hands off to the multi-boot loader which invokes the Solaris file system on the CD-ROM or once the system's configured on your hard drives. So the handoff is basically from the BIOS to GRUB, from GRUB to multi-boot, which invokes the kernel with proper parameters, which performs hardware detection, including how much memory, CPU, video card, etc. Now when you're at this menu, you need to make an option, or select an option that is. Our options include the interactive, which is the default, and notice I just moved the arrow key up, which caused it to time out. Solaris Interactive is a default graphical or GUI installer. If you intend to install using a GUI, go to option number one. That's the interactive graphical interface. The second option, Custom Jump Start, is similar to Kickstart within a Red Hat Linux environment. It allows you to automate installations by providing text files, which answer pretty much most, if not all, of the questions the Solaris installer prompts you for. So in the event that you intend to install multiple systems in an identical or fashion, you'll want to consider using a custom jump start installation. The third option is a Solaris Interactive Text, which is a desktop session. Basically, this provides a graphical environment with a text box. So you do, or you perform the entire installation within a text box that's within a graphical environment. If you want to avoid the graphics altogether, the final option, or the fourth option, Solaris Interactive Text, is the way to go. The entire console becomes one text screen which allows you to install the software. You'll see, or you should notice, that there are two other options including Apply Driver Updates and Single User Shell. The first CD or the DVD for Solaris 10 version 106, that is, and usually it applies for most versions of Solaris, allows you to boot the system in a rescue mode. The final option, number six, single user shell mode, basically allows you to gain access and mount the file system and perform any repairs in the event that you have corruption or you've forgotten root's password or something else that requires single user shell. Usually you'll boot from the CD or the DVD in the event that you're unable to boot from the hard drive, but most times you should be able to boot from the hard drive not needing the CD, but the option is here and it provides a minimal shell which allows you to read the various UFS file systems that are accessible to Solaris. And the fifth option should be self-explanatory. It allows you to apply driver updates. Oftentimes an operating system is released prior to hardware that you may have purchased. So for example in this case the, this system's a system that's pretty common. It's been out there for a while. It's a Dell PowerEdge 2600. However, let's say you've purchased a newer series from Dell, HP, IBM, IBM, or any other manufacturer that was manufactured after the release or the ship date of Solaris 10. There may exist hardware in that particular system that you may not have drivers for causing you to download, well, first locating and downloading the drivers from the manufacturer's website and using it during the installation of Solaris. No differently than you'd do with any other operating system such as Windows or any distro of Linux. 
So basically, you're able to apply driver updates, and you'll usually use this option for key drivers, such as drivers for accessing mass storage, drivers for accessing NICs, and perhaps for video cards and so forth. So we have six options to work with. The default option, if we select a no option, number one, will install Solaris in a graphical environment. The detection of the VGA card and the monitor will take place. And the second option, Custom Jump Start, assumes that you have a script or a file, a text file, a special text file that the Jump Start process relies upon for installing in an automated fashion. Of course, any options that are not specified will cause the installer to prompt you. Let's say, for example, the host name or IP address or subnet mask or default gateway or some missing item, such as time zone or locale information. And again, the third option, interactive text, will give you a text box within a graphical environment. And the fourth option, Solaris Interactive Text, just gives you one console environment. You may be wondering, why, did, why are there so many options? Well, the reason is as simple, or, or is very simple, and is as follows. The various installation methods require various amounts of memory. Usually memory is the key factor here since Solaris 10 will run on a pretty old x86 system, as old as 120 megahertz, but of course that isn't a recommended processor to install the software on, but it will work. However, memory is key, and if you have a low amount of memory, such as 256, which for a server nowadays is considered to be low, then the Solaris installer will default you to installing Solaris in the text or console session mode. So you will be unable to install the Solaris 10 10106 release in graphical mode unless you have at least 512 megs of memory. So depending on the physical configuration and limitations of your system will determine the option that's right for you for installation. But we're going to go ahead and do the text-based installation next.